tell us that my computer was uncooperative. Okay, so uh, I'm Leslie Kelbling. This is joint work with Tomas Lozano Perez. Um, we'd like to think of our problem actually is making robots behave, but this is uh, a journal track presentation, a paper that appeared in IJRR, Integrated Task and Motion Planning in Belief Space. And what I want to do is emphasize integrated, actually, task, motion, planning, and belief space. So now I'm going to offend everyone in the room um, by talking about sort of three different planning communities that I've in intersected with and been involved with and talked to, right? So there's uh, robot motion planning people who typically focus on a single robot in continuous space that doesn't touch anything. It has a starting configuration and an ending configuration, and the problem is to find a path through that space from one configuration to the other. Uh, in classical symbolic planning, we have large-ish highly factored discrete domains in general, completely observed at deterministic dynamics, typically satisficing. In the MDP, PONDP community, again, we typically have small discrete state action spaces, general word. Okay, so everybody knows each of these communities and they're each working away and they're generalizing in a bunch of interesting ways, but I would argue that the, each community is somewhat involuted um, and that these things are not necessarily modular. That is to say, I don't have faith that the work that each of these communities does, even though it's very good, will ever kind of be in a state to be in somehow plugged together. So I'm abusing my position of having been given the privilege of giving this talk to kind of exhort people to think about how to actually design a joint solution to these problems. Right? How to think about the fact that maybe you'd be interested in connecting up to these other pieces and think hard about the the whole thing at once. So what I'm going to talk about and what I can really just kind of demo for you and, and ask that if you're really interested that you could read the paper is a first cut, very rough approximate run that we have taken at the problem of integrating all three of these considerations to solve the problem of a robot doing what we would like to think about as in some sense generally intelligent things. So we're not interested in a robot that can clean kitchens per se because we could automate, you know, uh, tag things in the kitchen and, and make it so that the robot could clean the kitchen, maybe. Um, but the question is, can it do it for the right reasons? Can it do it from first principles? Can it do a variety of different kinds of things in the same domain? And so on. So imagine that a robot is faced with the problem of cleaning this kitchen. It's a really hard problem, right? The spaces are big. They're mixed, discrete, and continuous. It's arguably kind of unbounded dimensional, the state space of that kitchen, depending on whether you want to count the grapes or how you assess the rottenness of stuff in the fridge. So all kinds of, of dimensions and values. It's an enormously long horizon. If you think about the number of primitive steps it would take the robot to clean that kitchen, it's you just, again, it's, 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 an, it's a really big number, thousands or, or more than thousands, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands. Um, and the uncertainty is fundamental. And it's not the kind of uncertainty that, for instance, often robotics people like to think about, which is kind of like Gaussian noise on your sensor readings. Oh, surely we do have Gaussian noise on our sensor readings, but we also have deep and fundamental uncertainty about what's inside the container or whether the people are going to come home or whether they like spaghetti for dinner. Right? So that's not just sort of sensing error. That's kind of deep, deep uncertainty. And you have to, I think, handle it differently. So the question is, how do we try to address those things? Um, and so our particular approach uh, is going to be to kind of deal with the large continuous state and action spaces by using a technique that's a favorite one in this community, which is really to use the language of logic and geometry to give short expressions that describe big sets of states. And I'll go into how we do that in a minute. We're going to address the long planning and execution horizon by being very aggressive in a temporal hierarchical decomposition uh, where we get some efficiency at the cost of some effectiveness in acting in the world. And we're going to deal with the uncertainty in the present state and also in predictions by doing a, a kind of a replanning strategy in a very approximate determinized model, but doing it in belief space, which forces us to wrestle directly with the question of what information the robot does and doesn't have about the state of the world. Okay, I'm going to go whipping through a couple of ideas and then basically show you an extended example. So again, we'll use symbolic representations for the state of things in the world, but these symbolic representations critically will not be our only representation of what's going on. 
Underneath, we will have detailed geometric representations of the robot and its configuration. We integrate some aspects of the low-level robotic planning up with the task planning so that, for instance, whether or not the robot can execute a particular physical action is directly involved in the question of how we decide to approach a problem at the high level of abstraction. And we observe the fact that, in general, we may understand the initial state of some planning problem in a great amount of detail, either in actual space or in belief space. Right? We know an enormous amount of detailed stuff about the world that we can't effectively encode symbolically. And so, but we also observe that we'll typically have a short, compact, sort of symbolic description of a goal, which leads us to find that at least for our purposes, regression is a, is a pretty natural strategy because we can keep compact logical representation of a goal and of sub-goals, which are pre-images of that goal under actions, without ever having to try to encode the current state of the world in complete logical detail. So that's going to be kind of our strategy for dealing with large state spaces. The temporal hierarchical decomposition, so everyone, everyone, when asked what do you do when your domain is, when the horizon is too long, they say, oh, you need hierarchy, and lots of people have been working on that. Um, our approach here is not particularly novel. Uh, we use some standard techniques for deriving hierarchical abstractions, and then we execute them very aggressively. So for instance, we might have a high-level goal G. We might plan for it at some high level of abstraction by doing pre-image backchaining, or what this community calls regression, which really freaks out the learning people. Um, we can come up with a plan in the form of uh, if I take this operator, this is my last operator, it would lead to the goal. And this, this thing here is the pre-image of that. It's, so it's a sub-goal, right? It's a set of states in the world such that were I to take this, do this operation, I'd end up in the goal. So what I end up after an abstract plan is I get a set of pre-images, which can serve as sub-goals for planning again at a more detailed level. So what we'll do is that we'll take this first pre-image here and make a plan for it take this first pre-image, make a plan for it, and so on. When we hit a primitive action, we're going to execute it. So we will go forward, leap ahead, begin executing actions before we are sure that we have a plan for the whole thing. That's risky business, but we don't actually know how to do anything else. And furthermore, in domains where there's significant uncertainty, you often can't do too much more than that because you may not have the information you need yet even to plan how to do the next phase of your action. Okay. And to deal with uncertainty, we're going to do, let's see, so we have a POM DP. I love it that Matthias told, said that multi-agent POM DPs are good. Be, I mean, single-agent POM DPs are good because they're easy. He did say relatively easy to solve. Uh, I think that's the only person I've ever heard say that. Um, but, but, so, but so generally speaking, POM DPs are really not that easy to solve, especially if they're big. The position that we're going to take is, oh boy, this projector's washed out. OK, um, that what we're going to do is, is, is a decomposition like this, where we have something that does state estimation. And the controller is going to have the following form. It's going to make some kind of a plan, maybe kind of a not very careful plan, kind of a messy plan, but it's going to make a plan. The plan's going to have first step. We're going to execute that step. It will change the world, that will generate an observation, that will go through the state estimator, and we'll have a new belief. From this perspective of the planner, its job is to make a plan for a trajectory that goes through belief space. From its perspective, all this stuff is the environment. So we're going to think about uh, states, actions, goals, everything being in belief space. So that's the job of the planner. OK, so how do we put these things together? We're going to use logical fluence then. We said logical representations. Normally, this crowd uses logic to represent sets of underlying states of the world. Instead, we're going to use logic to represent sets of belief states, sets of probability distributions. So to, just to give you a little cartoon idea of how you could use logic to represent a set of probability distributions, Imagine that we had a world that had three possible states. Maybe an object is in one of three locations. Then probability distributions for that domain are points in that triangle, right? There are sets of numbers that sum to one. Um, and so for instance, if we wanted to say that I believe that object O is in some location L with probability at least epsilon, where if there are three possible locations, this statement would correspond to a set of beliefs a set of probability distributions, which is the sort of upper corner of that belief simplex. And if you wanted to say, for instance, that I know the location of the object, but not saying which one, 
then that would correspond to one of these corners. So we can use logical fluence to describe sets of beliefs. And that's going to be our planning language and strategy. We can then write down operators in something that looks a little bit padiddly uh, uh, that talk about how now our beliefs evolve over time as we take actions, as we move things, as we look, and so on. Our beliefs change, and we can plan in that space. OK, so now what I'm going to do is talk about applying this to an actual robot. We have this robot named Eminem. Uh, our belief state is this big, complicated thing. It's a, it's a joint estimate of the positions and orientations of the robot and objects in the world. It's also an estimate of which parts of the space are or not occupied. So it's a big, hairy, ugly thing. You couldn't imagine, I think, writing down a set of logical fluence that characterized the beliefs very well directly. Um, we do motion planning in a way that takes into account uh, the uncertainties in the positions of objects and so on. And we use a set of symbolic fluence to describe the sets of belief states. So the ones that we use in the robot domain are things like this. That I believe that I know the relative pose of object one with respect to object two uh, to within delta with probability at least epsilon. Right? So this is some predicate on the joint distribution of the relative positions and orientations of these two objects. Uh, I believe a region is clear with high probability. I believe an object is in a region with high probability. I believe an object doesn't overlap a region with high probability. So these are all fluents that are about geometry and belief together. OK, so here's an example. Imagine the robot has to take this blue box and put it over on this side of the table. It had, there's a can in the way. Oh, one minute. One minute. Well, I'm just going to flip through this very quickly then. So it plans at a high level of abstraction. So for instance, the highest level plan it has is that I want that soda box to be in a target domain. Its highest level plan says I'm going to place that soda, and then I'm going to look to be sure it's there. Because its goal is to be sure that the object is there, not just to try to put it there. Its goal is in belief space. So it has to place it and then look to verify. Uh, it's going to ultimately plan to go and get a look of the of the can to be sure it's where, of the box to be sure it's where it thinks it is. It goes over there, it takes a look. OK, it goes over, it takes a look. Uh, what it does is it sees there's something in the way, so it goes, oh no, and makes a new plan. Uh, it sees that the space it has to reach through to pick the thing it wanted to pick up is occupied. So then it tries to get a better look at the thing that's in the way. It goes up there, it moves the hand out of the way, gets a better look. I'm going to go really fast. Uh, then. Uh, it sees where it is, it picks it up, it finds a place to put it down, it puts it down on the table. It doesn't bother looking at it again because it doesn't really care where that thing is because it was just getting it out of the way. It comes over here, gets a better look, picks the thing up, moves it over here, puts it down, yay. OK, so what do we think? That we can get robust integration between sensing and acting by planning and belief space. Uh, we have to do our planning very approximately, but we hope to make up for that by doing a closed loop thing. And I'm going to not talk about that anymore and um, show you another example, the robot trying to get out of a room. It's basically the same code that's doing this as was doing the previous thing. So it's reasonably general purpose reasoning about moving things around and doing stuff in the world. And with that, I will say thank you. We, we do have time for one question. True. I take it there's nothing stopping the robot from picking the object that's in the way up and setting it down so that it's in the way of the destination of the other object. Is there is correct? something stopping that. Because it reasons that it, the sweat volume it needs to pick up the thing it really wants needs to be clear. It looks. It says, oh my goodness, that volume is not clear. I have to make it clear. How am I going to make it clear? I'm going to pick this thing up and put it down in such a way that the volume I needed remains clear. So, so if it's in the way, it'll fix it, you mean. But it could, nothing's, the plan doesn't say, by the way, whenever you move something so that you can get a better bead on the object, don't put it in the path of where the object is if, supposed to be. I mean, it, in the regression planning, if it needed a condition to be true, it will avoid violating it. Uh, OK. Yeah. Let's thank the speaker again.